Thank you. Yes, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. And it's true, I really missed the cold weather a, a, a little bit. I miss the snow. It sets me in the cold day mood, so it's, it's really nice. It's also good to see uh, tourists in their natural environment here. So yeah, it's good. It's very good to visit Sudak uh, for the first time. Uh, so yeah, I wanted to, to tell you a little bit about uh, one of my interests uh, about supermassive black hole binaries, how they form, how they come about, and what we know from theoretical and observational perspective about them. Uh, as I'm sort of hinting in, uh, in the title, the search for supermassive black hole binaries continues. Also, I'm not a particularly loud speaker, so if you cannot hear me well, please let me know and I'll, I'll do my best. That's what I tell to, to my students as well. But they give me a bigger mic, too, so. Okay, so one of the, the natural places for supermassive black hole binaries to form are galactic mergers. And we know by now that this happened. They are common. We see a number of very nice examples on the sky of, of galaxies merging. And uh, if most of these galaxies carry their supermassive black holes with them, uh, this will be pretty much taken for a ride. They will be sitting at the center of the potential well of the host galaxy. And initially, they will start interacting with gas and stars uh, somewhere in this swirl of a newly formed galaxy and they will lose their orbital energy and angular momentum. And this is how we think the two black holes, which are initially unbound, sink towards the center and eventually form a gravitationally bound supermassive black hole binary. Those that continue sinking uh, towards the center of the new galaxies even further will enter the gravitational wave regime, start emitting uh, gravitational waves and merge really rapidly relative to to their evolution up to that point. And uh, in some cases, the remnant black hole that forms in that merger may receive a natal kick. And that kick may be strong enough in certain cases to actually kick it out of the host galaxy. I will not be talking about this last phase of, uh, of binary evolution today, but it certainly attracted a lot of attention uh, because of its astrophysical consequences and because of the potential to create empty nest galaxies, basically galaxies without supermassive black holes <coughs> in the center. So what do we know about this gravitationally bound supermassive black hole binaries nowadays? There are a good number of pairs of active galactic nuclei that are observed with separations of kiloparsecs or ten, tens of parsecs. But the, it's much smaller separations uh, separations of 10 parsecs or so, there are very few supermassive black hole binary candidates that we have. So their main property is that they are observationally elusive. And I'm mentioning that, that some characteristic separation for a supermassive black hole binary is about 10 parsec. And this is, as a rule of thumb, the separation at which the mass enclosed in the, the binary orbit becomes comparable to the mass of stars and gas enclosed in a binary orbit becomes comparable to the mass of the binary itself. Of course, in detail, this varies, depends on the properties of the galaxy and exact mass of the binary. But as a rule of thumb, those are the separations where supermassive black hole binaries form. So a practical obstacle in finding supermassive black hole binaries in the sky is that, for example, if you take uh, a separation of one parsec, and put that binary at redshift of 0 0.2, not even an extremely high redshift, its angular separation in the sky will only be about 0 0.3 milliarc seconds. So this tells you right away that uh, most of our uh, observatories and telescopes uh, cannot actually spatially resolve a supermassive black hole binary. For example, if both black holes accrete uh, gas, then you would not resolve two bright nuclei in any image. So no observatory can do it except perhaps for radio interferometers. And this figure actually shows uh, uh, a radio contour image obtained with a very long baseline array, which peaked at the very center of a galaxy and found that this galaxy, discovered by Rodriguez and Manis and collaborators, has two very compact cores uh, at separation 
of only seven parsecs. So this is a projected separation on the sky, uh, where one of these two cores actually sports a pair of active radio lobes. It is thought that these two cores actually harbor supermassive black, hole, like black holes at their center. And this is our actually most convincing candidate so far for a supermassive black hole binary. Uh, so what are the processes that actually influence the orbital ev evolution? Oh. So, yeah, so, is there, so to this source, is there any mistake? I mean, I assume there's nothing in the optics or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to indicate that it's not a, uh, would, would you be able to see if it was a weak spot? Is there any hope of seeing it at any other? In, at, at any other wavelength, yeah. you mean? So uh, I know that there have, has been some follow-up of this object, but nothing conclusive came out from those observations that would either support a binary case or, or eliminate it. So, so far this is basically the, the most com conclusive piece of evidence that we have on, on this particular object. Is there any other uh, alternative uh, explanation for, for this? In principle, uh, well, it kind of makes sense that this would be a supermassive black hole. Okay, it's attached to, to, to jets, right? The other uh, core could, in principle, be a uh, blob of plasma that somehow was deflected. Uh, an interesting thing, or a bit of information about these two cores, that they both uh, exhibit a relatively flat radio spectrum, which is typically found in, in AGN. So this is what led basically to to suggestion that both cores may harbor supermassive black holes. So uh, in terms of uh, physical processes that determine the evolution of binaries or the, the, or the disk separation, basically the binary can continue to shrink its orbit to, uh, due to viscous torques. Uh, for example, interactions with, uh, with the gas. And this figure here uh, is a snapshot from a simulation by Quadrant collaborators, which actually shows a distribution of gas and accretion disk around the supermassive black hole binary. So one of the most striking properties uh, that you can see right away that is that there is a hole in the middle of this accretion disk. So the reason why there is a hole is because the binary torques uh, evacuate the gas from this very central region of this accretion disk and eject it. So basically binary uh, behaves as a giant mixer or a food processor that keeps ejecting the gas and on that account reduces its own orbital angular momentum and continues to, to spiral towards the center of the, the galaxy. And uh, another way effectively for binary to, to get rid of its orbital angular momentum is to interact with stars and that happens via tree body uh, interactions in predominantly stellar environments where there is not a whole lot of gas. Uh, so what are the binary orbits like given this interaction with, uh, with the gas and uh, stars? Well, uh, the theory or theorists tell us that the orbit of the binary is most likely to be eccentric, whether it interacts with the gas or whether it interacts with, uh, with the stellar background. And if it happens to evolve, in a galaxy which is gas dominated, so that a picture uh, snapshot of the binary would look something like this, its orbital evolution is very likely to slow down once the binary is bound and once it escalates this low density hole in the center of the disk. And the reason for that is that binary continues to gravitationally interact with this inner rim of the circumbinary disk, which is some now at some distance from the binary. So basically this is not a very strong gravitational interaction leading to a very slow orbital evolution of the binary, very slow exchange of or orbital angular momentum. When it comes to uh, the interaction with the stellar environment, uh, this is where usually the last parsec problem is mentioned. So just to recap uh, what uh, the last uh, parsec problem refers to, Effectively, as the black hole binary interacts with stars through three body interactions, uh, it was found uh, in 2000 or, or thereabout that eventually, uh, when the binary is at separation of about one parsec, it would uh, effectively exhaust its supply of stars. So it would 
scatter away all these stars that are on or orbits very close to the binary, and then there will be very few stars left for the binary to in interact with. So the point where this happens, uh, uh, it was predicted by Merritt and Neil Savage, or the other way around, that the binary uh, evolution will slow down, and the binary will stall at the separation of about one parsec. And I just wanted to point out that if, if this indeed is the case, uh, then uh, we would expect to find supermassive black hole binaries at precisely that separation, right, where their evolution is slowest. However, there is no uh, universal agreement uh, that, uh, whether the last pro parsec problem exists or not. So recently, uh, there were um, results reported by, by uh, Fazil Khan and Miguel uh, Preto indicated that if indeed galaxies are not perfectly spherical and symmetric, which we certainly don't expect from merging galaxies, we expect them to be uh, uh, deformed, then there will be still plenty of stars on the orbits that will pass close to the binary so that binary can interact with them and continue their evolution towards smaller and smaller separations smoothly. So uh, I guess in short, the result is that there is no last parsec mm -hmm. problem. However, more recently uh, in, uh, in their work, Vasilev et al., and I, b I believe that uh, Fabio is a co-author actually on, on that paper, uh, they resurrected the last parsec problem again. Uh, so we are not, we are, we are at a point where we started, but uh, I guess with a little bit more knowledge about this problem, and the last parsec problem is still an open one. Another question that pertains to, to binary, binaries in this stage of their evolution is what happens with their spins? So whether the black holes are spinning, and if they are, what is the orientation of their spins? Uh, and again, uh, it is not obvious that there is a single answer that describes uh, all possible evolutionary scenarios for binaries, but it has been suggested uh, by me and some other people that black hole binaries, if they accrete gas from some very large accretion disk, galactic accretion disk, uh, which has well-defined plane, that black hole spins would align with that large disk through accretion torques. And the reason why this question is interesting is that black holes that merge and have their spins aligned actually don't uh, have a very strong gravitational wave recoils. So remember when I mentioned uh, in, in my first slide that uh, the newly formed merged black hole may receive a natal kick. Those kicks happen for particular orientation of uh, black hole spins and for particular black hole mass ratios, but those kicks are very weak when the spins of the two black holes are parallel to each other and parallel with the orbital angular momentum. So if the spins are aligned, we wouldn't expect a lot of uh, kicks to happen. However, black hole binaries can also evolve in collision-less environments, meaning in stellar environments, and if so, it's quite possible that their spins are misaligned. And in such cases, you could still expect to, to have uh, black hole kicks, which can reach high velocities up to maybe 5,000 kilometers per second or thereabout numerical relativity styles, relative styles. So what are the detection strategies uh, that have been used to, to look for supermassive black hole binaries at this, these separations? Well, one detection strategy that I would like to, to talk a little bit more about later are shifted broad emission lines. So uh, I, I won't tell you about it now. But also parcel, pulsar timing arrays. Uh, in case of the pulsar timing arrays, pulsars are used as a network of clocks, effectively. And the uh, time arrival of the signal, signals from the pulsar is measured at, at Earth. And then all possible noise sources, which would cause that arrival time to uh, to deflect from some average value are modeled out of the signal. So whatever uh, difference in the pulsar pulse arrival time is found is ascribed to basically gravitational wave that is moving through space somewhere between the Earth and, and the observed pulsar, which causes the change in the, in the time arrival of that signal. 
And pulsar timing arrays are actually expected to observe not so much individual gravitational waves from individual merging supermassive black hole binaries. They're actually expected to observe a stochastic background of gravitational waves from all black holes that are merging in the universe, all massive black holes. Uh, they have a chance of detecting individual uh, mergers, but that chance is much lower. And as a matter of fact, ETA researchers tell us that they expect to make detections of this stochastic gravitational wave background already in 2016 or thereabout. Uh, which is interesting because that puts them uh, directly in the race for detection of gravitational waves uh, in race with LIGO, I guess. Okay, so what if the two black holes continue to sink towards the center of, of the galaxy and their separation shrinks even further? Well, at some point, at separations uh, less than 100 or parsec or maybe 10 to the minus 3 parsecs, uh, gravitational waves will kick in. So the binary will start losing orbital energy and angular momentum very rapidly and it will merge on a really short time scale. Meaning that uh, looking for binaries in this phase of, of their evolution in life, it's not really easy because they will be short-lived uh, in this evolutionary stage. The dominant physical process that uh, determines their evolution is gravitational wave emission. And uh, really the motivation to study these objects, since it's so hard to, to look for them in surveys because they're short-lived, this is exactly the observed candidate <laughs> that we have. Notice that it's an empty picture frame. We don't really have candidates for merging supermassive black holes. Uh, but the motivation to study them uh, came from the prospect for detection of gravitational waves by the space-based gravitational wave interferometer, which you may know under the name of LISA or ELISA. So ELISA's future uh, has been uncertain for, for some time now until uh, maybe a week or two where the European Space Agency announced that they officially reserved a launch opportunity in 2034 for a s gravitational wave space-based observatory like LISA, meaning that uh, they will support the, the development of technology and uh, science, which will hopefully lead to a, a launch of one such mission in 2034. Telling you that it's going to be some time before actually uh, this kind of a mission is put in space and is able to, to detect merger, merging supermassive black holes. Which also means that if we uh, want to, to learn about these objects, th the only way we can do it is via electromagnetic observations for next, in the next 20 years or so. And uh, actually one of the, the ideal observational signatures uh, in case when gravitational waves from these objects can be detected is uh, actually a, a coincidental electromagnetic and gravitational wave signature that would be emitted by the same merging binary. So the reason for that is that gravitational waves will be imprinted with a, a lot of really detailed information about the massive black hole binary, like the mass ratio and the spins and uh, something about uh, its orbit prior to, to the merger while the electromagnetic signature would actually provide a link to the host galaxy uh, where the black hole binary merged. So it would be possible if both signatures are detected to put merging binaries in the context of the large scale structure uh, and, actually, uh, and actually do useful astrophysics uh, with it. However, a likelihood of such an observable electromagnetic counterpart is determined by the physical properties of the binary environment, meaning the temperature of the gas, the density of the gas that exists in this accretion flows close to, to supermassive black hole binaries. And they're very uncertain, actually. Uh, since we don't have any observed candidates, these properties are only based on theoretical considerations. So they're, in a way, an educated guess, guess and theorists. And, uh, one way to study binaries, since we don't have observed candidates, is actually to, again, simulate them. And in this phase, uh, uh, 
when binary is emerging due to the emission of gravitational waves, uh, simulations that follow the binaries are fully relativistic simulations. So I'm showing here a snapshot from one such simulation done by my collaborator, Tanya Bode, which actually shows the gas swirling around the binary, which is just about to, to merge. So uh, detection strategies for now, in the next 20 years or so, will be search for some kind of electromagnetic signatures. Okay, so what are then the key questions that, uh, that we have uh, about supermassive black hole binaries and that, that pertain uh, to, to their observational signatures? So starting from easier questions and uh, going towards uh, more difficult ones, the first question is, is there a unique observational electromagnetic counterpart that we can use to basically distinguish uh, a supermassive black hole binary, whether it's at a subparsec separation or in the final stages of merger. A little bit harder question is, if yes, then in which wavelength band? This already assumes that we know something about the properties of the gas, how hot it is, what is its density, so that we can predict the emission mechanisms and the wavelength band where this emission will happen. The hardest question of all is whether this uh, electromagnetic signature actually carries uh, some information about the, the black hole binary itself, about the spins, about the mass ratio of the binary, and about its environment, whether it's a stellar, predominantly stellar, predominantly gaseous environment or, or something else. And I guess if I had to summarize uh, what um, electromagnetic signatures have been predicted, I would say many and varied <laughs> are predicted by theoretical models. And simulations and theoretical models actually at this point can uh, predict pretty much any signature starting from radio all the way to the gamma ray wavelength. And if you're not happy uh, with that answer or with that statement, I, I hear you. Uh, I think that at this point we desperately need some observational constraints in order to, to narrow down the theoretical parameter space, which is really, really broad. Uh, in my humble opinion, we uh, cannot really justify making even more complex uh, models and more complex simulations because our observations are not there yet to support the complexity of, of models that we can build. Uh, and I think that simulations are actually complex enough because they include MHD, they include full relativity, many, many bells and whistles. They don't include everything, not from the first principles, but uh, they're, they're pretty sophisticated and complex. But we are in the need of observational constraints which can actually point us in the right direction when it comes to the part of the parameter space that we, the theorists, should be looking at. So just to give you a, a, a flavor of how one such study, theoretical study, may, may look like uh, that aims to model observational signatures of a binary. I wanted to discuss work uh, done by, by my collaborators uh, and myself. Uh, and I also wanted to mention that Carlos Valenzuela has done some very, very nice work uh, and studied what are the observational signatures of black holes merging in uh, background electromagnetic fields. So this uh, study actually focuses on merger of two black holes. So it follows the, the two black holes, just few orbits before the merger. Uh, and two black holes are immersed in gases environment. So one of the first th questions that you ask yourself as a theorist before you uh, turn on your simulation is, what are the initial conditions? And because we don't know exactly what are the physical conditions in the vicinity of supermassive black hole binaries, we uh, started with different scenarios. In one scenario, uh, we assume that the two black holes are immersed in a very hot, radiatively inefficient, hot, uh, inefficient uh, gas flow. Uh, this flow is thermally supported by, by thermal pressure. And somewhere at larger radii, uh, far away from the black holes, when radiated cooling becomes efficient again, it may as well turn into an geometrically thin accretion disk, again. But it's very spherical and very 
uh, low density at the, at the very center. In the second scenario, the two black holes are orbiting within uh, geometrically thin uh, and optically thick accretion disk. Uh, they created this low density opening at the very center of the disk. And both black holes can capture, in principle, some amount of gas from the inner edge of the circumbinary disk. So they can form their own mini accretion disks. And uh, they can light up effectively in, in this scenario. Uh, we picked these two scenarios because we thought that they effectively bracket a whole range of physical scenarios uh, where in which black hole binaries may find themselves. Uh, and our additional parameters are the mass ratio and black hole spins, basically, of the two black holes, meaning the orientation of, of the spins of the two black holes. So to, to give you an idea, uh, how one such simulation looks like. Uh, I wanted to show you uh, a merger of two black holes in a hot accretion flow. So that's the first scenario that I outlined. In this scenario, the two black holes have equal mass. So the mass ratio parameter is equal to one. They have spins. Uh, both black holes have spins of 0 0.6. The spins are parallel to one another, parallel to the orb orbital angular momentum. You can already guess this is where the two black holes are. Uh, the color shows the gas density with the lighter color marking the higher density gas. And notice that the size of this computational box is actually really small. It's only 10 gravitational radii. And just uh, as a reference, uh, a, uh, the event horizon of a non-rotating Churchill black hole uh, is only two gravitational radii. So this is very close to, to the merger. I should also uh, mention that this is a purely hydrodynamic, fully relativistic hydrodynamical simulations. Simulation, there, is, there are no magnetic fields and there is no radiative cooling there, okay? So as, as the two black holes start orbiting, you will notice that they will come closer and closer uh, to one another because they are losing orbital energy due to the emission of gravitational waves. And they're forming this low, uh, high density tails, which will intersect and create uh, turbulence. All the while, uh, the high density gas is mostly located somewhere in the region between the two black holes. So it turns out that this orbiting tails will create some modulation in the light curve that I will show you la later on. The two black holes merge, and due to the perturbation in the background potential and the loss of mass, the gravitational waves, from the, the central black hole actually very rapidly swallows this turbulent gas that was uh, mixed by, by the two black holes prior to the merger. Sorry? Period. What was the, the period, period of, of the binary? So uh, there is no single number, obviously, that I can give you because the period changes. But let's say at uh, the largest separation, if they were moving on, a, uh, on, a, on an orbit without any losses, I would say uh, about an hour or thereabouts in the frame of the binary. It is. They, this so is full GR. Yeah. Why am I not seeing an event horizon when this black hole is of order M uh, So, um, I guess there is an excision. Uh, there is an excised numerical horizon in there. But, uh, yeah, I guess the, it, you don't see the hole. And it, it, this. Two black holes are spinning, they will create a spinning black hole, so it would be a little bit less than 2M. Yeah, you should change that. Yeah, but it's, it's probably there, it's just not explicitly shown. Yeah. 
Okay. So one way to, to sort of estimate what the light curve of this event uh, looks like, well, before that, actually, I wanted to show you one more thing. So uh, if you are after any kind of variability in this flow, which could set apart a merging binary from any other AGN, you, you will be looking for some characteristic variability that is uh, produced by the two orbiting black holes. So what we looked at in this particular case is the region in this computational domain where the Mach number of the gas is larger than one. The Mach number being the velocity of the gas divided by the local, local sound speed of the gas. So uh, these are snapshots that correspond to the same simulation that we just saw for the same mass ratio and the same spin. So initially we see that actually the shocks are confined to this region uh, of two high density tails that follow the two black holes of their orbit. But then later on, the shocks are mostly confined to <coughs> the, uh, the region or, or just uh, outside of the orbit of the, the black hole. In the end, when the black hole, the two black holes merge and form the remnant black hole, that black hole very quickly in the end swallows the shock gas. And that again creates a very characteristic drop in luminosity, which I'll show you next. So in order to obtain some kind of estimate for what the luminosity curve would look like for this very hot and low density gas, we assume that the gas is optically thin, so that all photons that are created could escape to infinity right away. And then calculated Bremsstrahlung uh, radiation effectively using the simulated temperature and density of the gas. So what I'm showing here in, in that computational domain is luminosity and some normalized units as a function of time. So the luminosity uh, from the accretion flow within the, the numerical domain that we're simulating is normalized to the luminosity of the flow of a single black hole, which was simulated for the same distribution of gas, just placing a single black hole at the center instead of two black holes. So this is why the luminosity is sort of close to, to one at the beginning and the end. The time is in units of n. And just as a reference, one unit of n is about 50 seconds for 10 to the seven solar mass black hole. So the extent of time that you are looking at here <coughs> on the x-axis is actually uh, several to five hours in the frame of reference of the massive black hole binary. Time equals zero marks the coalescence. So different uh, colors here and different lines uh, illustrate um, what the slide curve would look like for several different simulations that were carried out. Uh, and we carried out simulations for equal mass binaries or for mass binaries with mass ratio one half, which is uh, a mass ratio that effectively numerical, uh, numerical relativity simulations can handle. Uh, simulating smaller mass ratio becomes increasingly, uh, increasingly difficult for, for numerical relativity and simulations become uh, too numerically expensive. So in some scenarios we simulated parallel spins of the two black holes. In some other scenarios we simulated a spin uh, uh, configuration like this and th the second one in purple was more like this. One thing to notice is that all, all this curve look very, very similar to one another with some very small dif uh, differences between them. We see some gentle undulation on the top of the, uh, the curve, which is related to the orbital period uh, from of the binary as it merges. So the frequency of this signal sort of rises to, towards the coalescence. Uh, and this quasi-periodic variability is due to the beamed emission uh, by the, the two high-density tails that are orbiting uh, and approaching and uh, receding from, from the distant observer. This rise corresponds to the shock gas that accumulates within the orbit of the binary just before the merger. And the sudden drop of, of, uh, is associated with this very last moment when the remnant black hole swallows a, a lot of shock gas that surrounds it. 
So uh, we're very happy, actually, that to see the rapid rise and drop of our very robust features of all light curves, uh, regardless of the parameters and initial conditions, because that was a result that was also recovered by another group who did a very similar type of a study, but starting with uh, using different codes, starting from different initial conditions, they basically recovered this sudden rise and, and drop off, which in terms of observations, I guess, would correspond to an object which became brighter on the sky and then suddenly disappeared effectively. So that would be the, the signature in this case. The quasi-periodic variability actually is a very low amplitude and uh, I think they would probably be hidden by any kind of AGN-like behavior and any kind of AGN-like variability would actually be a noise with a larger amplitude that would probably hide any kind of quasi-periodic uh, signal in the light curve. Okay, uh, so if you're an observer or ever thought about such things, uh, you would definitely want to know what kind of luminosities uh, you should expect and uh, whether such luminosities can be detected. So we have carried out a simple estimate for what this luminosity is, uh, would be in case of uh, this particular accretion flow. And since we are uh, normalizing to the uh, luminosity of a single black hole, I'm only showing the luminosity of the flow for the sing around the single black hole. So, for example, Bremsstrahlen radiation would be of order of 10 to the 41 Earth per second, assuming that the central black hole has mass of 10 to the 7 solar masses. And again, we assume that this emission is optically thin in order for photons to escape uh, from the merger to, to infinity. The temperature of the gas, in this case, the proton temperature of the gas is very close to 10 to the 12. This is gas that is very close to the event horizon of the black hole, so it's at its hottest. But uh, because the, the plasma uh, is very low density plasma, we expect that the electrons would leave at actually much lower temperature. And for, for the purposes of this calculation, because the electrons are uh, cooling much more efficiently than protons, we assume that the pro uh, temperature of electrons would be two orders of magnitude lower than that of protons. Yes? What do you decide how much gas they produce when you say yes, they broke it up, but we just don't know? So that is a good question. The, the question is how, how do we decide how much gas there is or what is the density of the gas? So we don't know what the density of the gas is. And, uh, but what one can still do is make an assumption and use density as a free parameter. So effectively, depending on what the density is, you would get some answer for uh, the luminosity of emitted by that gas. So we made that assumption here, but making an assumption that the gas is optically thin within the Bondi radius, meaning the region where gravity of the black hole binary dominates uh, the dynamics of the, the flow. So basically for tau equals one or less than one, this is the value that one would get. In order for the flow to be optically thin, it has to stay be below some critical density. So this is what you are basically tuning by tuning tau in this expression. So effectively, this is an upper limit on the luminosity from such an accretion flow for 10 to the 7 solar mass black hole. Do you know how much mass that corresponds to? Oh, very little, very little. It's negligible. Relative to, to the mass of the, the black hole binary, it's negligible. So it pretty much continues its evolution as if, if, if it was in vacuum. Is it reasonable to ask what is the accretion rate in the accelerations of the problem? So it's reasonable to ask, and I, I don't remember what it is. Again, for the reason that this is a free parameter, uh, in principle, it can be a value that depends on the density of the gas, but then we don't know what it is. Well, so that 18 percent is probably going to be uh, 2 tenths of a uh, 45 or whatever. Yes. So, uh, yeah. right. So I don't know what the accretion rate exactly corresponds to, but yeah, you are, you are right. The Eddington luminosity would be 10 to the 45 Earth per second for Eddington. Uh, yeah, for 10 to the 7 solar mass black hole. So this is. 
orange magnitude order. Okay, and then playing the same game to estimate the, the, what would the synchrotron emission be from a uh, similar type of a flow, assuming that there are magnetic fields of some particular strength uh, in that central part of the equation flow. For this estimate, we assumed that the energy in magnetic field is only about 10% of the thermal energy of the gas. And we obtained some synchrotron luminosity. So for the <coughs> gas, where electrons are at the temperature of 10 to the 10 Kelvin, Bram Straubing emission would peak somewhere at hundreds, hundreds of kiloelectron volts. So this would be hard X-ray emission. Synchrotron emission would peak somewhere uh, in millimeter or submillimeter range. Uh, and it would affect provide soft photons for inverse Compton scattering. So those synchrotron photons could in principle be upscattered uh, by inverse Compton scattering, which could uh, have luminosity of, of similar order. And again, it would peak somewhere in hard X-rays. Yes. Uh, so it does, so this is a, a hydrodynamical simulations, simulation, which means that the temperature of the gas is uh, something that evolves uh, as a function of time. But we do start with initial conditions which are hot and low density accretion flow, which is relatively uniform in density, and then set it off and see whether the distribution is as, uh, as the binary evolves. So again, this is just one, one type of a model uh, that I, I wanted to, to show you. And to give you an idea about how would this other model look like where the two black holes uh, merge in, in a certain binary disk, uh, I wanted to show you yet another animation. Let me just ask, how much time do I have? Uh, is it till four or? Yeah, it's four, but we both end up around five. Ah, okay, I better, better speed up. Uh, okay, so um, in this particular case, this is a merger of an unequal mass binary. The, we are looking at a vertical slice through the disk, so the disk appears as a wedge, looks, looks sideways. The spins of the two black holes are misaligned in this case, and the geometric aspect ratio of the half thickness of the disk relative to, to the radius where that measure is taken is 0 0.2. One thing to, to mention is that now the size of the box is different. Uh, it's uh, 60 gravitational radii. The two black holes are here. Here is the more massive one, and the little dot is the less massive one. And they will come in and out uh, of the plane of, of the screen. So you will see them bobbing around. Uh, we see that both black holes manage to capture some fraction of gas from the inner edge of the disk, but not a whole lot. And effectively, they're all, at the same time, they're pushing the disk back, the, the torques from the supermassive black hole binary. So in this particular simulation, we found that, yes, the two black holes will manage to, to accrete a little bit of gas, but they quickly decouple. and. Uh, the, the density of the gas in that central region is really very low, so we concluded that emission uh, signatures will not be particularly bright or observable. In more recent simulations, uh, which follow the evolution of the binary in a magnetized disk uh, with a fully consistent uh, magnetic rotational instability and, and all other bells and whistles, they find that actually the accretion rate may be significant enough into this cavity to provide enough gas for, for this uh, supermassive black hole binary to shock and interact with in order to create very luminous Eddington level, uh, Eddington luminosity level signatures. So, so these are simulations by, and work by Xi et al, who was uh, a graduate student with uh, Julian Crowley and also by Scott Novel, but also more recently by Brian Ferris, uh, who, who carried out simulations in 3D. So your simulations, are you essentially react or do you just evolve it to all the simulations from what you're given? 
So uh, I think in, in Paris too, you did the work of two audits. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So in, in this particular work, we did two, but it's really expensive to, to follow uh, many, many orbits. So we, we did it for, for a little bit uh, and then started the simulation. So um, it's somewhat relaxed, I, I would, I would say. Two yeah, yeah. The, where, where the disk has the time to, to relax a little bit in, in this uh, in this potential, but uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, in t in the time there is left, I actually wanted to to tell you uh, now that you have an idea of how uh, theorists and simulators uh, predict observational signatures and how the simulations look like. What is it that can be done on the observational side to look for supermassive black hole binaries? And uh, I, I again wanted to, to tell you about a particular observational effort that my collaborators and I worked on, uh, and I'm helping with ba basically since I'm a, a guest theorist on that project. So the idea is to look for shifted broad emission lines. And that idea is not new. It was already used to, to look for stellar binaries for spectroscopic binaries where each object is associated with some spectral emission line. And if you can see those lines in the spectrum and follow the, the orbit of the spectroscopic binary, you would see the modulation in the two emission lines due to the orbital motion of the stellar binary. Similar idea here except that if the two black holes have their mini disks associated with them, uh, you would see two broad lines because these two disks are effectively broad line regions around the two black holes when they're at separation of about one parsec. And uh, here is an example of such a spectrum. This is an optical spectrum showing uh, the hydrogen Balmer alpha line, which has two components. It has a narrow component, which is um, close to the redshift or close to the rest wavelength of the host galaxy. So it's typically thought that these narrow emission lines are emitted from the gas that is far away from the center of the galaxy and it's very close to the, the rest uh, redshift or rest wavelength of the host galaxy. On the top of that, you see a broad component of hydrogen Balmer alpha, Balmer beta line here, which seems to be offset with respect to the rest wavelength of the host galaxy. So this type of a signature could originate uh, from basically a, a supermassive black hole binary where one of the black holes is forming an accretion disk and this accretion disk gave rise to this broad emission line. Uh, however, uh, what I also wanted to mention is that theorists tell us, uh, tell us that uh, subparsic binaries are intrinsically very rare objects. And it was estimated by uh, Bornson and Lauer, Martha Voluntary et al, that only about one in 10,000 quasars in SDSS at below some redshift cut of 0 0.7 may harbor a supermassive black hole binary at subparsic separation. This value is very uncertain, probably by an order of magnitude up or down, but the key point uh, to, to take home is that subparsic binaries are rare objects and that one needs a large sample and also some very efficient method to select them. So taking uh, a radio image of galaxy by galaxy would never work, right? There is no time allocation committee which would approve such a project. And uh, one efficient way to search for, for supermassive black hole binary candidates is to sift through archival spectra, uh, such as spectra in Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and look automatically for unusual offset broad emission lines and tag those objects. So this is exactly what my collaborators and I have done. But I wouldn't be telling the entire truth if I didn't tell you that there are caveats in this process because this is an indirect method. Uh, there are uh, other possible explanations and other pro possible uh, scenarios which would give rise to similar observational signatures. And displaced peaks do not always mean binaries, nor do peaks that move. 
And that uh, is actually very nicely shown in, uh, on the example 3C390.3, which in May of 1990 and uh, 1989 showed some very peculiar peak in its broad, broad component of uh, this is hydrogen monomer alpha line, which was offset relatively to the narrow line component. However, just a year before that, this was a common double peak emitter, uh, meaning an AGN with a very, very broad emission line where uh, what it <coughs> thought, uh, in principle, that this broad emission line profile can be produced by a disk around a single black hole. Nothing exotic about it at all. So cases like 3C390.3 uh, taught us a lesson that displaced peaks don't always mean binaries. So keeping that in mind, how can one basically test this uh, scenario? And can, how can one test these candidates that have been selected based on their offset emission line? So this is a list of my collaborators. They're predominantly observers. And uh, observations in the optical and UV are led by Mike Heraclius. Observations in the radio part of the spectrum are led by uh, Sarah Spoliar. Uh, but there are also several other groups which are taking the same approach uh, with some small differences to look for supermassive black hole binaries. So one way or another, we're going to learn something about this object. Uh, and there are several groups working on it, so we are keeping each other honest. Uh, the idea is to take three epochs of data, where the first epoch is archival, uh, in coming from uh, Sloan Digital Sky Survey, and to obtain two more epochs of data using a variety of space and ground-based observatories. Uh, so based on the first epoch of data where uh, we looked for the objects with unusual broad emission lines, which uh, appear offset and Doppler shifted with respect to the rest wavelength of the galaxy, 16,000 SDSS quasars were triaged to 88 objects based on just shifted broad uh, Balmer alpha emission line profiles. So just to show you how that, how these cases look like, I'm showing stacked spectra of these objects where you see only the broad component of Balmer beta line. The dotted lines mark plus minus 5,000 kilometers per second offset from the rest wavelength of the host. So you can see that many of these broad lines, some of them exhibit very offset peaks. Some of them just exhibit an asymmetric distribution. Some of them have two peaks and so on. The second epoch of data was basically looking for any kind of modulation in this uh, broad emission line peaks and was basically uh, which would arise as a consequence of the orbital motion of the binary on a time scale of five to ten years. And uh, from 88 candidates about 14 exhibit profile shifts and accelerations which correspond to to the supermassive black hole binary model. So to give you an idea of what kind of binaries are targeted via this observational method, uh, the orbital period for some uh, fiducial binary mass of 10 to the 8 solar masses and for offset of the broad emission line peak uh, normalized to, to 1,000 kilometers per second. So this is basically the velocity projected along the line of sight. And this is the velocity that, is, that can be measured when the offset of the peak is measured in the spectrum. And then some unknown orbital inclination of the binary with respect to the observer as well as the orbital phase. So with all those parameters taken into account, the orbital period of the binaries that are targeted by this method can be of order of a few hundreds of years, meaning longer than the human life scale, time, uh, lifetime but it can be as short as 10 to 20 years. The uh, corresponding same major axis is the order of 0.1 parsec. And the accelerations in the, uh, in the modulation of the profile peak with respect to the rest wavelength is of order of 20 kilometers per second per year. Meaning with a, that uh, with a baseline of five years or so, the offset of the peak uh, is a order of 100 kilometers per second, which is something that can be easily measured from, from the spectra uh, at this point. Finally, uh, uh, 
So multi-epoch uh, observations are used to test and reject uh, the candidates from, from that sample. Uh, they include optical and UV spectroscopy. So here I just wanted to, to compare UV emission lines with, uh, with the uh, Balmer beta emission line and also uh, with the carbon-4 emission line to show that they, they look consistent with one another and they all look offset, which is consistent with uh, the broadline region being um, moving as a whole with respect to the, the host galaxy. Um, okay, I'll stop there. We are also undertaking radio imaging of this 88 candidates and uh, DLA find, uh, finding survey has already been completed. Uh, this work was done by Sar Sarah Spoller and uh, some of our object, objects in the DLA image uh, show compact sources. By the way, DLA is not expected to resolve two cores corresponding to the two supermassive black holes, but DLA finding survey is just looking for the nuclear radio source. And about 47 of uh, uh, 88 observed sources show compact emission. About 75 of them show some kind of diffuse uh, or compact radio emission. Those that show compact emission are good candidates for the follow-up with VLDA at even higher spatial resolution in order to look at the very center and effectively look for, for two radio cores. Uh, that VLDA program has been accepted and uh, but is not carried out yet. And uh, in the last minute or so, if you're a theorist, you of course uh, would like to use this uh, sample of supermassive black hole binaries to test evolutionary models, even by constructing probabilities that given some evolutionary model, a binary will be at a given separation uh, for a given mass ratio and given mass of the binary, as well as the given accretion rate, which stands as a proxy for the properties of the accretion flow around it. Uh, so one could effectively construct such a simple model, uh, calculate the emissivities of the accretion disks that are associated with the black hole and the circumbinary disk, and finally calculate the emission line profiles and compare the synthetic emission line profiles like this with uh, those that are seen in observations. So just very quickly, these two broad double peaked emission profiles originate with a minute disk around black hole one and black hole two. Circumbinary disk, the largest one, contributes very little to, to the total emission. It's just effectively passively illuminated by the other two disks. And the black line sort of gives you a total profile. And in some scenarios, these profiles can be very interesting. So this is something that can be compared in statistical sense with the observed set of emission line profiles. So in summary, uh, theoretical models of uh, supermassive black hole binaries are fairly uh, involved and sophisticated at this point. I would say that they're in need of observational constraints. Uh, and I'm optimistic because better designed observational searches have been uh, started and are being carried out uh, over the past few years or so by several different groups. Is it early to celebrate the discovery of supermassive black hole binaries? Yes, absolutely. Uh, but there is room for cautious optimism because so far the number of uh, black hole binary candidates observed uh, is in broad agreement with, uh, with predictions from the theory. Thank you very much. And I'm sorry that, that I'm over time. You're much shorter than any of the talks last week. Yeah, I appreciate that. <laughs> I, 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 I didn't realize that it's 50 minutes uh, time slot, but thank you for your patience. So for the, I guess for the last day, uh, so you did 16,000, but why didn't you do 100,000? Like was it more so to say, look, you've got this one had eight data that are in the band? Or is there right, right. So several different cuts had to be made. Obviously, signal to noise ratio is important. Redshift is important because uh, uh, 
I think in this particular sample, effectively what, what you need is that all your lines of interest are within the, uh, the wavelength range uh, of, uh, of the detector. So for this object, that translates to uh, Z of less than 0 0.7. Right, so it would show the blue column possibly. So exactly. So in order to see H beta, uh, well, uh, the redshift has to be less than 0 0.7. But other groups have looked at, like uh, Jen Green and her students, they looked at higher redshift objects and uh, they looked at, I believe, magnesium two line, which, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. But there is more than one way to do it and it's good that, that uh, somebody is, is doing that as well, yeah. So, so far we don't have images. There are images out there uh, in the SDSS for several of the objects, but we don't have images for all 88 of them. Uh, and uh, I guess that some of them will be imaged from the ground in the future and all the others, I'm not sure, if the proposals go through. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I don't think we know uh, a lot or anything actually about the hosts of this um, of this objects ex except for the very very few in the sample. Do you mean like environment? Like if yeah, like the 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 oh, you mean whether they are in the cluster they, or? They yeah, tidal features exactly. So the uh, the imaging com campaign is underway. And except for uh, those objects that exist in the archival data, we don't have images for majority of them. So I, I don't know. What's the nature of the work? Is it very hard to make uh, records for the So nice thing about this uh, uh, set of objects is that they're relatively low redshift. So the median redshift is uh, 0 0.3. Uh, so I would say below redshift of 0 0.3, uh, there is still a good chance, depending on the um, instrument and observational technique, there is a good chance to see tidal features. Below, beyond the redshift of 0 0.3, uh, uh, they fade away because of the low, low uh, surface uh, brightness. Yeah, so the tidal features, so it's the next step in the cloud-based habitat project when the yeah. setup is ready to uh, use it from, from uh, other galaxies from uh, hyperlabeled galaxies. Right. So we, we don't know that yet. So these were these objects were selected as based on their AGM-like optical spectra. So there is some selection in, in that regard uh, because all, all of them have O3 lines uh, so that, but uh, yeah, we don't know about these other properties. I, I agree with you that uh, it would be good to know that. It's, it's important. Yeah, that's a smoking gun. So um, I can tell you that, uh, that before the systematic studies uh, <coughs> were begun, there was a handful of candidates about, uh, about which we got very excited. All we had was one epoch of spectra and I contributed to the noise so I feel uh, <laughs> comfortable talking about it. Uh, so we, we saw an object, it had a, a very unusual, the, the Mm, perturbed and offset, broad emission lines. Uh, somebody suggested this could, this could be a recoiling black hole that is carrying its uh, broad line region with it. Stephanie Komosa actually and her collaborators. And we actually interpreted that broad offset line as a black hole binary candidate. There were a few others like that. And they were observed a few years later. So on some time scale after the first observation, their broad emission lines did not budge. What does that mean? So pretty much became obvious that a single epoch spectrum is uh, 
a dangerous way to lean. lean. Uh, it's, it's not enough. So uh, it may be a good way, quick way to select, but to select candidates, but then a follow-up seems to be essential. It's not an obvious working one. 